Great, awesome. Uh, I think we we have given people enough time. Maybe we can jump right in. Uh, Mark and Sarah, over to you. Awesome, thank you. Awesome. Hey everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thanks for taking the time. We appreciate it. Wow, this is so exciting. Thanks for coming in. Should we get started? Yeah, let's go. All right. So yay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, we're Mark and Sarah. We're the co-founders of climatedesigners.org. We'll tell you about our journey to starting Climate Designers and give you as much info as we can in the next hour to help you build an impactful climate career as a designer. We are also creating a new class in partnership with Terra.do called Becoming a Climate Designer that starts very soon. So we'll tell you more about this six week class at the end of our presentation, and then hopefully have some time to answer any questions you have for us in the chat. Um, we also have all the links, articles, and resources that we are presenting in this deck. Um, they are available here. It's the address on the screen, hopefully. Yep, we're good. So climatedesigners.org slash climate impact webinar. All right, so let's dive in. First, we're going to tell you who the heck we are, and uh, we'll, I'll hand it over to Mark to start us off. Awesome. Yeah. So um, I have a pretty crazy background. I'll keep it short. Um, I have a, a background in both web design and graphic design of two degrees in both. And uh, combining that with my love for punk rock, been listening to that for over 25 years now, this whole idea of questioning authority, fighting for causes I believe in, this DIY ethos, that has definitely seeped into my work. I just can't help it. <laughs> and so um, because of that, my work has always been under the umbrella of social innovation, social impact. And you know, over the course of my career, I wanted to, about five years ago, actually, I started to kind of really build up into this desire to take on bigger, gnarlier issues. And, and that's what we're doing with, with uh, our studio, The Determined, as well as Climate Designers and all the work that, um, that I've been doing over the last few years. And then just combining all of that, being a lover of the outdoors, I understand the value of protecting our environment, our home, and I wanna use my skills to do that. Um, why I'm doing this? So in recognizing the fact that design shapes culture and that what, what we as designers put into the world has an impact, sometimes negative, hopefully positive. And if our home is out of balance, then we're out of balance ourselves. And so everything that we have in our lives really does depend on a healthy planet. And I just love collaboration. And so I want to join others in crafting a new human narrative because our current narrative is the reason why we're in this mess in the first place. And so I want to use my, my creative skills to level up and, and be part of something bigger than myself. So that's just to give you a quick rundown of who I am and why I'm doing this work, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah. Thank you, Mark. Word. Um, so my background, I came from the tech world working as a UX designer in startups and uh, UX in the broadest sense of the word. Um, I also started getting into design systems and team systems and processes and doing more product management as well. Um, I was really into making the work that we do more efficient and fun. Um, and I really dove into the 60 plus hour a week uh, work culture, hustle culture in startup life in San Francisco. And that led to me uh, burning myself out. And around 2013, I really started taking notice of the IPCC reports that climate change is still happening, still a problem. I kind of had this idea that like it had all been figured out. <laughs> you know, I learned about it in probably the third grade in my textbooks. And, you know, it was like science would figure this out. But um, at the time I was working for a startup that was creating physical products. And I realized that consumerism is part of what's destroying the planet. And I just couldn't live with that juxtaposition of uh, the work that I was doing 60 hours a week, destroying my body was also destroying the planet. And so I was like, if I'm gonna um, kill myself, stressing myself out, I would like to be doing that uh, on something that matters. 
So um, our goal is to empower and support creatives building a different world, a world that values diversity and all human health and well-being, a world where we align ourselves with the biological imperative to create optimal conditions for all life to thrive. So I love seeing that there's such a global audience because we really love to um, think of this as a, we're all in this together on this whole big planet. Zoom will let me go to the next slide. I might be stuck here forever, y'all. Boy. Forever. Okie dokie. Um, I got this question. You know, we get this question a lot, and I saw it the other day. And the the answer that popped into my head when someone asked, what can individuals do about climate change? I was like, well, who's the individual? It depends. You know, is that individual the president of the United States? Is that individual a billionaire? Is it that individual celebrity? They can probably do much different things than some of us, someone else could do. You know, is that person an artist? What kind of skills do they have? Are they a writer? Are they young? Are they old? How much energy do they have? Are they burnt out? <laughs> you know, are they in a red state or a blue state? Um, are they dealing with poverty? Maybe they're too busy to, to do anything. Are they disabled? Same deal. Do they have children or aging loved ones to take care of? So it's really like individual action is individual and it depends very much who that person is. This is sort of the human centered designer in me coming out. Like there's no like one individual person. Um, it reminds me of an article I saw on AIGA, their awesome blog, but there's no such thing as a normal person. So like individual action for celebrity looks a lot different than individual action for someone struggling with poverty, for example. And I saw this chart, maybe you've seen something like this. Um, this one is from Drawdown. And, you know, they put uh, having smaller families or having one less children or something like that as like the highest, highest, highest impact that you can do um, for a lot of different reasons. We can go into that. Um, but it just kind of makes me feel like there's got to be something else we could do. Yeah, you know, and most individuals are pretty limited in how much that we can contribute to, to meaningful climate impact. And so, however, though, designers, being a special group with a lot of amazing skills, we have a few more opportunities than the average individual. Indeed. So this is a slide that we like to show with designers a lot to just show the power of design. Um, design helps businesses sell their products or services, obviously. The, that fact is why we all have careers, right? We wouldn't have a job if that wasn't true. But the exact value of design has always been difficult to nail down. And we like this story of the design value index analysis. It was back in 2013, 2015. Um, this was the height of the iPhone app era, if anyone remembers that, when investors were jumping on and cashing out and Apple was the epitome of cool and apps were like apps with poor interface design were quickly pushed aside if something better design came along. And so everyone kind of was starting to pay attention to this design thing. And the Design Management Institute developed market, uh, market index, they call it the Design value index, uh, a group of publicly held design focused companies like Apple and Kevin Miller and all the stuff that you see here. And they track the performance of this index compared to the S&P 500 over the last 10 years and found that the design led companies were outperforming the S&P by 211%. Yeah, so whether you work for a client um, or multiple clients in your own studio or perhaps in house, the design work you do really does help the company succeed. And so one of the biggest impacts that we can make as designers is making sure that we're helping the good guys. Yeah. So choosing who you work for might be the biggest thing that you can do. Now, when we first started our online community, Climate Designers, um, we began asking new members, we would turn around the question that they would ask us. <laughs> and we would ask them to answer the question when they signed up, what is a climate designer? And so there's a bunch of awesome results from that question that you see from our community and uh, through dialogue with one another and introspection about the design process itself, like I like to do, um, we're creating a new industry or at least a new specialty 
Um, one that traverses the silos, normally dividing different design specialties from one another. And we're bringing all that together and bringing information into our design process from other fields like behavior science, system science, and ecology. In doing so, we're empowering designers to confidently carry out design work that goes beyond reducing environmental harm and moving towards the improving of nature's ability to thrive. Right, so ultimately the aim of climate designers is to make humanity a positive impact while working in balance with nature. Yeah, contrast that to doing less harm on nature, it's, it's a totally different mindset, right? Mm -hmm. No, nobody's gonna go out with me. Have you asked anybody yet? No, but who would? I don't even have any good skills. What do you mean? You know, like nunchuck skills, bow hunting skills, <coughs> computer hacking skills. That's Girls so only want boyfriends who have great skills. This cracks me up every time. <laughs> So we wanted to get into like some of the skills that you need to design with the environment in mind. And that, that quote is the only thing I could think of as a graphic. So here you go. Um, so it's, it's more than just saying, I'm going to design with the environment in mind. Um, this mindset alone will unquestionably get you light years ahead of most status quo designers, making sure your design work makes a positive impact and avoiding negative unintended consequences. Um, but it requires some knowledge and skill building to do that. So that's why we're here. Today, we aim to get you as far along that path as we can. We only have an hour, so we're gonna sort of hit you with a lot of different resources to look into, depending on your um, specialty of design and all that. And um, it will be up to you to follow our lead and take it further in the direction that most makes sense for you and your career. The skills you'll need to learn vary uh, depending on your design specialty. And since this session is open to designers of all kinds, we'll give an overview of some of the most specialized skills. And then we're going to focus on the generalized skills that all designers need to learn for um, our deep dives. So we'll start with graphic design. Um, each design specialty has a mountain of knowledge to master over time, right? Like just, just to be that kind of designer. And you do that through experience and study. So like graphic designers master typography, print designers develop you know, relationships with vendors for papers and color matching, and package designers and develop a knowledge bank of materials to and, and assembly techniques. And you know, illustrators master different brush strokes and coloring techniques. And ind industrial designers master the balance of form and function within constraints and you know, so much more. So in the same way, each specialty will have certain skills and certain things to consider when really thinking deeply about our impact on our biosphere. So for example, print designers will need to consider the life cycle of the materials used from the paper. Uh, where did it come from? How was it made? Is it recycled from post-consumer waste or is it virgin paper from an ancient tree? To you know, the ink and varnishes and everything else, many inks are made of of petroleum products and they cannot be composted or recycled. So if you're printing a run of many tens of thousands of a design, these considerations among many, many others can make an enormous environmental impact. So we have a few books here up on screen and also in that um, webinar links page for you to dive into. I have um, probably heard the most about the green graphic design book from our community. Um, just the other day, someone was marveling at the list of resources in the index in the back of the book, like, oh my gosh, this is everything. So good stuff in here. And I want to call out specifically uh, Design to Renourish, which was co-authored by Eric Benson, um, one of our core team members helping us build out Climate Designers EDU, which is our design education component of climate designers. He's our, he's our buddy, he's awesome. So packaging designers, um, you know, you also need to consider the life cycle of the materials used from the source of the material to how it will be discarded. 
Uh, the ocean is full of single use packaging that was used once and then discarded, and probably designed by a designer. So, you know, should you look into compostable materials? Does everyone have access to the industrial composting, composting, why can I not talk? Composting facilities many of these materials require? Or is it a material that will break down in a backyard garden or compost pile? Will it, will it decompose by itself? Um, these are things that you need to consider. So it's a lot, right? Um, but we want to encourage you to go even beyond that and think differently. Uh, consider whether the product even needs packaging at all. Can the packaging have a use after the package is opened? Could we design in a more circular way? You know, think about the milkman. Everybody used to get milk delivered and then they would put the bottles out and somebody would come oh, yeah. and pick it up. And it would so be I had cute. them do a couple more of Hello? this. But Someone's speaking. Cool, cool. Um, multitasking, I get it, we all do it. So that's kind of what we mean by um, circular design. If you think about the milkman, where the package is sent back to the distributor and reused, which is awesome. And I don't know why we got rid of that system. I kind of do, but it sucks. Anyway, and again, if you're printing a run of many tens of thousands of a design, these considerations you know, are multiplied by how, how many things you get printed. So just because things are done a certain way now doesn't mean it's a good way. So maybe you could be the one to plant the seeds for change. Industrial designers, any industrial designers in the house? Um, Again, considering the entire life cycle of the materials going into the products that you design, where and how were the materials mined? Did you know that most plastic is made from petroleum? Um, how far did they need to travel? Or is the plastic plant-based? Um, what happens when the product is no longer being used? Again, what's the waste life? Um, can it be repaired, upcycled, or recycled? Or if the object you designed is discarded, how long will the materials take to decompose? And will they release toxic substances or greenhouse gases in the process? I was just on a panel yesterday with um, internal Microsoft designers uh, presenting to other designers how they started using recycled ocean plastic in a new mouse that they're releasing. And um, just really fascinating stuff talking about the, um, all the hurdles that they had to jump over to use a different material than what is normally used and how it's, it's about just kind of like taking a stand and saying, this is, this is the right thing to do. So again, amazing books and the documentary, the, his, uh, the story of stuff. And um, there's a short of the story of stuff too. Uh, I don't know if anybody has the video or the link handy to that, but um, you, can, you can get the gist really quickly with that too. Oh cool, there's a company, someone in the chat is um, advising for a startup called Trashless. That's the milkman for everything. Starting with groceries, yes, I need this. And takeout meals, yes. I'd love to jam with any of y'all on how to make them and their circular models successful in the hyper-competitive consumer goods market, that's awesome. Okay, cool. So, okay, let's get to the digital designers because I think I saw that there were a few and you're probably eagerly waiting, what can I do? So um, this is a term that we're using to encompass many specialties of design, which primarily do not produce physical objects, only digital, such as websites and apps. And honestly, you have a significantly less direct impact on the environment because you're not mining materials out of the earth and throwing things away. Um, in terms of you know, like materials being extracted from the earth and for the waste products at the end of the life cycle. The main direct environmental impact has to do with energy used. Um, in a world where all our energy comes from burning fossil fuels, it is really wise to use as little energy as possible. And in a world where all our energy will come from renewable sources, it will still be wise to conserve energy because 
the production of solar panels and wind turbines, like literally anything that we need, um, anything that we make, still requires materials to be extracted from the earth in large mining operations sometimes that produce immense waste and environmental de degradation, deforestation, and all that crap. So digital designers are really wise to consider choices that use energy efficiently. So um, especially those that have other user experience benefits like reducing load time and improving usability is just better for a lot of different ways, you know, multi-solving, multi um, solving a lot of problems at once. So keeping websites and apps lean makes them quicker, saves users bandwidth, and usually helps with search engine optimization too. So these are habits and skills that are especially impactful when designing websites that are going to be visited by millions of people a day, like you know, your Google, your Facebook, your Twitter. Same thing if you're printing something, like if you print a run of 200, it's not like the end of the world if uh, it's not compostable or something. And if you're you know, greening your personal website that only gets 20 hits a month, how much, you know, are you really saving? But if you are greening the homepage of Google, which gets hit, I have no idea how many billions of times a day, um, all of that data and energy saved is going to go a long way. Now, all that being said, we want to put the work of digital designers and really all designers, um, anything that we're doing in computers in the digital world, um, we want to put that in context with the greater scope of the climate crisis. So this whole pie is, um, whoa, <laughs> I almost knocked over my smoothie. Um, in terms of CO2 emissions, calculating the percentage of emissions that come from internet use, it's really tricky to do, but it amounts to around 3% of total global CO2 emissions. This is everything. So that means if, even if we made every single website on the internet as clean and green as possible, the most impact we could possibly ever make would be around 3%. So, Think about um, where we can make an impact on other parts of that pie instead of focusing really deeply into that little slice. So like sometimes I think some people are so busy just shaving off little bits of that tiny 3% that they don't think about the rest of the picture and they're like, oh, I'm good, I did my part, you know? So um, there's stuff like that in every aspect of sustainability and we really want you all to think about the whole picture and not get caught up on like just doing my little bit. Um, we think that design has the potential to make a much bigger impact than just that little bit. So just because digital design has a much lower impact on um, emissions and material stuff, um, this doesn't mean that digital designers get off scot-free. You know, sure on the surface, you have less material impact. So you're like, I'm good, right? But there is so much more that we can do to make a much bigger impact on our climate crisis. So let's let's talk more about the general skills that apply to all designers and um, digital designers we're talking to you too. Uh, I watched the Netflix documentary um, Social Dilemma last week because it's, yeah, it's still September, right? Yeah, it's, it's free on YouTube right now. So I had never seen it before. Um, but if you've seen it, you might realize advertisers pay big money to social media companies because they know their ads can sometimes influence some of us to buy something or take a class or read an article. And that is part of a strategic design that influences society. Designers, especially digital designers, are a big part of that influence. So think about, are we being used to influence society for the better? And some of the things that the... Um, social dilemma documentary drives home are directly related to design. So design has consequences. And these consequences are not the same as intentions. So even if your intentions are good, your design choices might have already influenced real changes you may not have intended or foreseen. So First, we want designers to realize that you are already are influencing change, whether you know it or not. <laughs> so in the, the social dilemma, they talk about this. If you were a designer at, at Instagram or Snapchat, for example, like what harm could you possibly do? I'm designing a fun little social 
photo sharing app. Um, you know, your design work was focused on helping these platforms gain popularity, keeping people engaged, encouraging strangers to comment on other strangers' photos, you know, to get people to use more filters or whatever it is that makes the company money. What harm could that do, you know? But that could partially be responsible for an upward trend in mental health issues and increasing suicide rates. We've also heard about you know, designers and engineers at Facebook working to allow people to create these echo chambers where they get to see only what they like and want to see while they get to see sometimes fake news and conspiracy theories on their platforms. And that may be partially responsible for influencing recent elections and therefore real policies and real material impact that has come since. YouTube um, has been receiving criticism lately for algorithms that recommend more conspiracy theories and then leads to more racist videos and then leads to young men joining violent radical white supremacist groups. You know, obviously they didn't mean to do that when they designed the algorithm, I think. Um, but that's what's happening. So we need to look at what's real, what's reality and not just at what we wanted to do. So this gets us into some more generalized skills, and this is for everybody, uh, along with a greater understanding of the planet we live on and the ways we are all interconnected. Beyond the list of materials to use or practices to avoid, what Mark and I are most excited about is to empower climate designers, regardless of specialty, with new skills that will help you think critically about new problems that may come up work through those complex challenges and design new ways of being for communities to live better with each other and with our natural world. So we really love Mike Bonchero's Ruined by Design. It was a um, huge influence on us. It calls for a set of ethics for all designers. We don't have anything like that, especially in social media and internet world. Um, perhaps laws will change and we may be required to be trained in certain areas about how our skills impact society. We might as well start um, thinking about it now. And in the meantime, we really love Tristan Harris's work. Um, it started as Design for Time Well Spent, which is a great pledge in and of itself. And then, um, sorry, at the, and then he designed, or he founded the Center for Humane Technology. And uh, we really appreciate what they're doing there. So as designers, how can we take a stand for the world we want to create with our work? Um, one of the things we're often asked during conversations with people in our community is, you know, now that I understand this material or that is more sustainable and better to use, how do I convince my team to change their practice and shift to this new material, especially if it's more expensive or it might increase our timelines? It's simply not enough to know what to do or what not to do if we don't know how to influence or persuade other people to change their behaviors, especially at work. So we are going to dive into some tried and true levers of behavior design, including some that we environmentalists or those of us on the left need to try more often because we don't. <laughs> and you'll learn a lot more if you read any one of these books, but all these books are great. And I think Mark has other, other books that he's been reading too. There's like tons and tons and tons of this. And as a UX designer, this is the kind of thing that I've always been really fascinated with. Um, so it's, it's the UX with the capital U and, and X, I guess. Anyway. Ecology. We live on a planet. This planet is a living system. And without a deep understanding of those systems, we risk finding ourselves causing unintended harms with our choices. So there is tons and tons and tons of amazing information that biologists are unearthing about the way nature and evolution works so that we can boost our understanding of how best to be a positive influence. Um, I'm just gonna like extra recommend less is more. It's a really well articulated, clearly written book that covers a ton of stuff because all of this stuff touches everything else. It's just mind blowing. 
we also get into systems thinking, the science of systems. Um, without this understanding, we could find ourselves really overwhelmed, kind of banging our heads against a seemingly immovable monolithic giant boulder of the entrenched status quo. And the good news is there are leverage points and things that have been discovered about working with systems and how to find them. And um, with that knowledge, we can put our small individual amounts of energy to the places that will have greater systemic impacts, which is pretty powerful. And we need to understand that, you know, the climate crisis is a pollution problem. Pollution is only possible because it happens primarily in places, literal places on the planet, where the people who know about it lack the power to stop it. This power imbalance stems from colonial imperialism and racism. We cannot design new systems if we are ignorant of that reality or if we ignore that reality, as these systems will only be per perpetuated unless we unite against them, all of us. So if you see somebody doing a strike or a boycott or something, um, radical solidarity means joining in and, and being part of that. So we're about to see mass waves of climate immigration around the world. Those of us in the global north, in North America and Europe, yada, yada, we must do whatever is in our power to influence culture, to be accepting of refugees, or we will add increasing fossil fueled militarization and war to the already chaotic crisis of extreme weather disasters. And so um, I had this quote that I pulled, I didn't pull who it was from, but um, I'll paste the link in here. Uh, when we allow violence to happen to others, we are permitting violence to happen to ourselves. Radical solidarity means defending all life in accordance to their own needs, as if our lives depended on it, because in many ways it does. So there's the link to um, where that quote came from. So moving right along. Yeah, so we've been working on climate designers for just under two years. Actually, next month will be our birthday to your anniversary. Yeah. And so during that time, we've set <clears throat> up a number of design principles that have helped us define what it means to be a climate designer. And we've kind of summed them up into these four points, right? So first being that designers need to realize the power that they have to shape culture and make sure that they're using that power for good, for the good of all people. Number two, we need to work towards creating conditions for all living things to thrive. We aren't trying to do less harm. We're actually working to repair the vitality of the ecosystems people depend on for survival. Number three, we need to design with communities, design um, with and not for, evolving as many different perspectives as we can to discover and respond to unintended con consequences before they become widespread and harmful to more people. And number four, we need to define our outcomes, measure our successes, and iterate towards meaningful change. <clears throat> and so we often hear from people excited to become a climate designer. They say to us, oh, I quit my job. I'm starting my own business. I'm going to do all this climate positive stuff, right? And we say, yes, congratulations. Welcome, you know. Um, and then about six months later, uh, we hear them again, and they've been struggling. Client projects are too few and far between. Uh, maybe there's not enough budget to do all the most important things. And, um, and yeah, they, they really are in need of, of support. And, um, and it's, it's tough, but we're trying to change that. We're, we're hoping to change that narrative. Yeah, surviving as a small design firm, if you're thinking about going this route, it's really tough in any niche, 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 um, whether climate related or not, you know, running your own business takes skills. We're not always taught as designers, like, how to do sales and negotiating and you know how to market yourself um yeah water bear is awesome um how to network and find new clients all that stuff so tough as this may be to hear while the world desperately needs more climate designers need doesn't always lead to a business opportunity so be sure you have a strong pipeline of clients a marketing strategy to get more and a solid sales strategy and the skills needed to get prospects to convert to clients before going at this on your own and 
the good news is we want to say to everyone, we, you don't have to run your own firm. There are plenty of other career options for climate designers. That's what we're going to dive into in the next section. We generally divide the various ways a designer can make a climate impact with their careers into the following categories. So um, we have entrepreneurial, whoops. <clears throat> and under entrepreneurial, you know, you could start a design agency, you could start a tech startup, you could found a nonprofit, you could just go out into the world and be an influencer, like a media influencer on Instagram and um, get sponsorships, build a brand that um, produces money that way, you know, there are fashion influencers, so why not climate influencers? You know, being a solo entrepreneur like that, we have a bunch of examples of people that we know in our network and admire who have gone that route. And uh, at least one of them is on our, um, our course as a guest lecturer. So you'll hear a little bit more about that way of life from Molly Williams. Um, so yeah, like we just discussed starting your own design firm or partnering with a tech founder or a science founder to start your own startup. If you have the skills to run a business, go for it. Like, that's awesome. Make sure you have the mentorship you need to support you, maybe with like a business coach or joining an accelerator relevant to your chosen niche. You don't have to do this alone. Even if you're a um, solo entrepreneur, you need to have a community of supporters, mentors, and uh, advisors, and you know, even just peers that you can talk about this path with because it's, it's hard. The next one is um, changing the current company that you're at from within. And the images that we have here are from uh, Emily Cunningham and Maren Costa started this group at Amazon. Full disclosure, they got fired for it, but every single thing that they do seems to um, make headlines and is positive for the climate. Uh, for the climate. So it's, it's just amazing what they've been doing. So anyway, don't feel like you have to quit your job to make a climate impact. In fact, you might even be able to make a larger impact on the climate crisis right where you are. If you work for a large or medium you know, status quo corporation with no climate mission, you might be surprised at what kind of climate impact you could make using your existing influence and relationships inside this company. There are also big progressive orgs like Microsoft, uh, Square, Shopify. They're investing millions in direct material climate action. So, you know, if you work for one of those companies, it's great. Stay there. It's awesome. Uh, if you have, if you are already at a, a company, you have started growing your influence at that company. And if you have influence at a company, you can, you know, the more influence you have, the better you can convince your org to follow in your footsteps or in the footsteps of these people. Um, ah, I keep hitting buttons when I don't need to. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, you know, you might find ways to have influences over the materials used, all that stuff that we talked about before, the supply chains, any large waste impacts that the company makes. Um, we've talked to designers who have started cross-departmental sustainability initiatives within their orgs that didn't exist before. So we just say like, make your commitment to climate action loud and proud and people will take notice. Now, if you are looking for a job and you don't wanna start your own company, working um, as a designer, inside a company like any of the ones that we've mentioned previously that are climate focused, um, whether it's a marketing strategy firm or a organization that creates a product or service that creates climate action. Like we said, you know, that 211% boost, that's going to find work for places that need the, the boost that design gives. Um, the possibilities here are really endless. So we have a list of um, job sites on our website, climatedesigners.org slash jobs. And um, within those links are tons and tons of different opportunities being posted all the time. So we wanted to um, elevate this exercise that was presented by Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson of the How to Save a Planet podcast. 
And they suggested that everybody do this and, and this will be kind of our homework for you if you choose to accept it. So making a Venn diagram for yourself, especially if you're kind of like, where do I fit into this whole climate thing? Um, the circles are what brings you joy. The other one is what is the work that he's doing? And then the other one is what are you good at? And then thinking about the center, if you can notice what's at the center, um, what overlaps all of those things might give you a unique creative idea for how to apply your work to climate action wherever you are. So I highly recommend that everybody do this exercise. Mark um, has it, has his students do it. He's teaching a climate designers class right now and says that it's always very insightful. Right, Mark? That is right. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's a great way to start. And I, I saw Jeff's question in the chat earlier that I think perhaps, Jeff, if you haven't seen this Venn diagram, you're asking about like where to start, what has the most impact, things like that. Um, because th things seem so like daunting in terms of where do I even begin? This is a really great exercise to at least help you get going on um, with your first step, two steps, five steps, whatever, just to get something going in terms of what you can do um, with the skills that you have. Yeah, starting with the what brings you joy, um, this is hard work, you know? Anything, anytime you're pushing against the status quo, it's hard because the status quo has a gravity of its own. And, um, Sometimes it feels like the world pushes back. And if you have that joy and that passion as a foundational element of what you're doing, it will just give you so much more energy to, to push. As somebody who has burnt out in my job, um, I know a lot about that like inner motivation and energy. And like I literally cannot work on anything that I'm not excited about <laughs> anymore. <laughs> which is kind of a bummer if you know, you're trying to earn money, but when you're trying to do good in the world and then using this Venn diagram to figure out what the world will pay you for, you can find where that inner fire and uh, keeping a roof off of your head where those, those things overlap. Lots of cool resources being shared in the chat. So um, we wanna get into a little bit about our class. Um, I know that we've given you a lot of stuff to think about. Um, you don't have to think about that all on your own. It can be a little bit overwhelming. We have a discount code for people who have joined this webinar to learn about the course. Um, if you sign up for the course with the discount code webinar25, you'll get 25% off the six week course. And um, it starts, the application deadline is October 2nd. It starts October 4th. It's a six week class. We're going to have some live and some asynchronous material. We're going to have weekly live discussions. We've, we're currently planning on doing those two times uh, during the week. So it covers time zones that are global. Um, like I mentioned, we have guest speakers. And then at the end, the last two of the six weeks, we'll do a group design project. So you'll break up into teams of three-ish and create a project that you can put in your portfolio. So we want to walk through the course a little bit, what kinds of things we're going to cover. The first week, we want to meet you where you are. Um, so your designer concerned about the climate crisis, we're assuming. And based on people that we've talked to, you know, maybe you, you feel like this. So if you're feeling like there's gotta be something you can do beyond recycling and turning off your monitor when you're not using it, um, you know, this is all about what we talked about at the beginning, designers having that um, power to shift cultures. And we're going to talk about, you know, much deeper into, um, individual actions versus systems change, some of the historical stuff that we've seen, what's worked and what hasn't, and how to find your place. And then week two, we're going to talk some more about um, that bigger, more expansive understanding of our world. 
So um, talking about colonialism versus the indigenous wisdom, talk about climate justice, what that is, and start talking about how we can shift narratives. The third week is about action. So um, what are some of the frameworks and tools that we can use to make sure that the work that we're doing is making a measurable impact. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about behavior change and some of that culture jamming stuff that we talked about before in this presentation. And then week four, we're going to go into leadership because like we said, uh, it's hard to convince people to change. So um, figuring out how to influence others and even take care of yourself as you go through this um, work get as many people on board as possible. And then weeks five and six are the design challenge. We'll talk you through how to um, work with teams, how to come up with fun ideas and validate those ideas. And then um, week six, you'll do a pitch for the class and uh, tell the story of your project. And that will help you get into um, what goes in your portfolio. So here are some examples. Go ahead, Mark, and talk a little bit about this. You know, just quickly cover a few examples from previous uh, classes. Um, this was a project that um, combined the idea of um, brewing your own kombucha, saving that SCOBY, producing uh, objects from that SCOBY, um, really kind of a fun think wrong approach. Uh, the Tour de Trash was combining the traditional bike race of Tour de Tra or Tour de France with tapping into the craze of Soul Cycle. And so people ride through landfills while raising awareness of the um, trash waste, uh, landfill waste in the US. Uh, let's see, this was a fun little project combining, or I'm sorry, um, putting together a whole TV and web channel at the intersection of nature, lifestyle, and news. And they were using mascots as a fun way to cover challenges as well as solutions. Um, and then the last project was addressing food waste. So all the discarded food from food facilities would get turned into um, dried fruit. And then per percentages of proceeds from uh, purchases will go in retraining farmers who were displaced um, due to, um, you know, um, due to conditions in their homeland. So retraining them on how to how to farm new land um, wherever they end up um, addressing the climate refugee crisis. Love so those. just a so really, sh really sh uh, quick example, some projects that um, came out of previous classes. Yeah. So again, here's that link for all of the resources that we covered and we wanted to kind of bring it to an end so we could take any questions that you all have. I'm sorry, I'm sorry it took so long through that. Um, but we have about 10 minutes left. And yeah, I wanna hear, um, hear from you all. Yeah, so feel free to put them in the chat or uh, unmute. Um, I'm gonna go through some previous comments in the chat. When will the next session be? Uh, good question. Um, not sure yet. Uh, I think yeah. it also just depends on the success of this first session. So exactly. um, maybe early next year, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So um, Kristen, you've already signed up for the course. Can you use the discount code? Sure, why not? Reach out to uh, us or maybe the Terra team and they'll hook you up. Um, the classes be uh, during Pacific time. Yeah, so our live classes will be uh, weekly at 10 a.m. Pacific, but obviously they'll be recorded. So for those who can't make it, we'll have access to those um, video files right after. And then on Thursdays, we have two live discussions, one early in the morning Pacific, one late Pacific to, um, to, uh, to be time zone friendly. Um, but everything will be recorded, everything will be documented. So if you can't make any of the live stuff, um, you, you will still get the full experience of the class. And I'm putting the code in again, webinar 20, oops, webinar 25. But yeah, it's been really fun to kind of build out this whole um, program with Terra. It's been an opportunity to combine a lot of the things that we've been sharing with our community, uh, that we've been sharing with our classes, um, that we've been just sharing with our, our clients too. And so uh, this Terra course is a, has been kind of the, 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 the 
um, the combination of all those that we feel is touching on a lot of big things that we feel designers and the design industry, we're not really talking about. You know, you wouldn't expect us to have conversations about colonialism or um, indigenous wisdom or things like that, environmental justice in a design course, right? But we need to have those conversations. We need to start to have an understanding of the importance of those things and how we as designers can use them to create better um, products, services, experience, things like that, so. Um, a question we got in the chat a while ago from Nandini. Um, well, one can design packaging that is circular regenerative, regenerative even, it is most often dif diluted due to client budgets and their tendencies, which at some point deprioritize planet positivity. How do you navigate through that? Um, so yeah, I think one of the things that I say when I answer that question is to understand the business holistically. Um, we're in a really fortunate place right now where consumer demand is asking companies to be more planet positive. And that means when we create a product that uses something, you know, even if it's not 100%, if it's even slightly better than our competitors, we have a competitive advantage. And that comes through the marketing budget. When you have a um, like moral philosophy that appeals to consumers, they're going to advertise for you through word of mouth. And so that frees up more budget. Um, maybe that can be a way that you pay for the more sustainable material. So a lot of companies split up budgets into silos and they don't think about the um, marketing budget when they're thinking about the profitability and all that stuff. But if you can work with marketing to make a case for this, you know, this would be cheaper to market because people will tell each other about it and will evangelize for you because you're doing something good. You know, something like that. Um, the other thing, if you really want to play hardball is like we kind of mentioned, I think laws will be changing. I don't know when, but you're getting ahead of potential mandated changes that will be expensive to make later. So you might as well do it while you've got that consumer demand. You know, like you can attack it from multiple angles. And that's kind of the thing that we're talking about when we're looking at influence and persuasion, and, you know, stuff like that. Did any of the student projects you shared move from concept to development? Is that a goal for these courses? Um, it's not um, a goal for a six week course, but I think it would be cool. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the difference between this Terra course with the two week design uh, challenge at the tail end of the course is that the difference is that we as climate designers, we have a community. Sarah and I also run a creative studio called The Determined where we work exclusively with uh, climate organizations. So with our networks, connections, resources, all of that stuff, there is no reason why potentially the projects that are coming out of the Terra course can't actually become real projects. Um, we have experts, we have resources, so why not? Um, you know, maybe consider this Terra project as your next creative move or a career move. So um, yeah, I think it might just be up to the, the team putting the project together. And um, I think we could definitely make those happen. Yeah, and um, Sophie asked if we have a Slack. We don't use Slack. We have a um, another platform called Mighty Network that we use. And it's uh, a, a very active. We have over 2,000 members now. Um, it's a combination of like Facebook, Slack, and Eventbrite as well. So it's kind of all thrown in, into one website. It's uh, pretty amazing. There's tons of different topics and circles to you know follow and be a part of. And a lot of our um, members are global, young professionals, seasoned professionals, everyone in between, all walks of life, designers, and even non-designers too. We don't check IDs at the door. So we have people that are project managers, people that are um, writers, people that are um, you know, design researchers. So we have a lot of different people within our community. Yeah, I think if people are engineers, writers, videographers, you know, design adjacent, I think they would be a very good, you know, what's the word, um, synergistic uh, team. If you meet if you meet a team with designers and people who had other skills, you can you can do a lot. 
Yeah. Yes, Robert is saying, um, like I was saying with funding for sustainable work, like any design change, it's often on us to try and determine the ROI, be it financial or sustainable. Um, also considering the risk, uh, risk can be quantified and pitched as a motivation for businesses to make a change. Like, yes, risk of news headlines or cleanup costs. Um, extreme example, Volkswagen's emissions conspiracy and the following fines that they were hit with. So, you know, one, like I said, if you wanted to play hardball, one technique that we've heard of is as, especially if you have visual design skills, um, you could mock up a potential future scary headline scenario and be like, we do it because we want to avoid this, <laughs> right? Or, you know, just bring up examples like that Volkswagen thing and be like, yo, this is the right thing to do. I know that the incentives aren't in place right now for us to, you know, do these better sustainable practices, but we think there will be. And, you know, let's, we might as well change the foundation of a product. It's 12 o'clock. Rather than yeah. having to go back and change it later. And, and, and two more things to add to that. One, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, younger uh, millennials and Gen Zers really being vocal about this and that they are in fact demanding change. And so a company, whether it's a, a new startup or a hundred year old company, if they don't step up and do something, uh, they're gonna have a hard time finding talent and even retaining talent. And the second thing, I'll, I'll, and maybe this is a good thing to end on, I know we're at time, um, climatedesigners.org, we subscribe under the doom and bloom narrative. We want to see a positive future. We feel like design can have um, a huge role in painting what that positive future is. We want to avoid the doom and gloom narrative. It doesn't get anyone out of bed, right? It doesn't excite anyone to want to step up and do something. And so if we can change that narrative and, and see this crisis as, more as an opportunity, imagine this beautiful thriving world that we can all create, co-create together, um, cleaner air, clean water, more food, healthier food. Um, and so that's the approach. And we're going to get a lot more into that in the Terra course. And you'll see if you uh, join our community, follow us on social, um, that is the narrative that we subscribe to. And we need more of that out there. And so designers are a great um, supporting cast member in helping that narrative along with helping those that are on the front lines, the scientists, the researchers, the policy folks. Everyone needs design, right? Designer, Design and designers are in high demand. Every company needs designers. So let's use, let's use our power, <clears throat> our responsibility, our talents to actually not even move the needle, but blow the freaking needle up and create a more just and harmonious world that we need to create in order for us to have a thriving planet. Yes. Preach. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, you can you can log off now. I know it's the top of the hour. We won't keep you. Um, there is a recording if you feel like you missed anything, and the links will be sent out to everyone as well. When, where will the video recording be available? Probably by the end yep. of the day. And it'll be on the website, climatedesigners.org slash climate impact webinar. So it'll be embedded in there. So just give us a few hours and we'll put it up there. Yeah. Thank right, you everybody everyone. for being here. Thanks again. Have a good rest of the day, evening, and we'll see you around. Mm -hmm. Bye.